I have two sick ones, two young sick ones. Uh, this morning, Beverly took a, cho took a chance and left the older sick one with the younger sick one, but that doesn't work too good, so she's there with both of them. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. John chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. John 10, beginning at verse 9. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And that's what we're going to talk about this evening, an abundant life. Everyone in this world, I don't care who you are, Everyone in this world searches for an abundant life. But some look at it wrong. And then Christians know we want the abundant life too that's only found in G Jesus Christ. That's the only true abundant life. And the Lord will give this abundant life to all who receive him by his commandments. If, he, if we will live... Uh, according to his will, then we will have a full life in Christ and we'll be full of blessings. Uh, Jesus gave his life on the cross for all of us. He rose from the dead so that we could have eternal life with him in heaven. So becoming a Christian and living a faithful life to him is the abundant way and only perfect way because he is our perfect Savior. This inspires us, doesn't it? Then this inspire us to obey his commandments. Then we'll have that living hope we talked about this morning at, at home in heaven. In John chapter 10 and verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I, I can't go on without telling you a story. I'm going to tell you a true story. I, I, I can't help it. Every time I come to the word sheep and Jesus being the shepherd of the sheep, I have to tell you this story, and I've never told it. I know I haven't told it here. I've told it many places, but not here. I had, when, my old, young, when my oldest boy was, I guess he was about five, and uh, his Bible class teacher was teaching him, and it was about Jesus as our shepherd, and he takes care of us and guards us. And uh, First, I need to tell you that Jeff always wanted some sheep, but I didn't want any sheep. I never wanted any sheep. I don't want any sheep now. And uh, he wanted them bad, and I'd say, well, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. I, I, I'll see. I, I don't know yet, but we'll see. I kept doing that. So finally, she's teaching about Jesus being the shepherd of the sheep, and he raises his hand, and she says, yes, Jeff. He says, teacher, someday my daddy's going to buy me some sheep. He called it seep. And she said, well, that's, that's nice, Jeff. Won't you sit down? Let's, let's go on with it. And so, so she went on teaching the class, and she taught it and taught it. And at the end of class, she was talking about the sheep again, and Jesus is our shepherd, and someday we're going to all be with him, and he is going to be the shepherd of the sheep. And Jeff goes, she goes, yes, Jeff. Teacher? I think we'll all be in heaven for my daddy buys me them seat. <laughs> See, he had me pegged pretty good, didn't he? He had me pegged good. But the good shepherd, John 10 in verse 11, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus gave his life on the cross for us. He is our shepherd. And we follow him through this life. Without him, we can't find an abundant life. You can't find it. Without him, there's no forgiveness of sins. There's no chance after, uh, for a home in heaven after this life. Having an abundant life is conditional on our obedience to him. Revelation 22 and verse 14 tells us, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they have the right to the tree of life and may enter in or enter the, by the gates into the city. 
So those who live their lives without Jesus Christ will never be truly happy in their soul. Uh, they may think they're happy. Uh, they ask, uh, sometime you've heard this, I know you have, how can anyone be truly happy in this world? How can anybody be truly happy in the terrible condition our world is in? I've even heard people say, what is the use of living? What is uh, for, why would you have an abundant life in a world like this that's, that's really not worth living? And they lose an, a great opportunity, don't they, to be a Christian and, and live an abundant life? How is abundant life different from the world? Have you ever thought about that? Just how is it different from the world? Abundant living for a Christian is life of faith, a life of faith in Him. We walk by faith and not by sight. Second Corinthians 5 and verse 7 says that. We walk by faith and not by sight. We walk differently from the world around us. We are to be different. And so we walk with the eyes of faith. We walk with the hope of God. Our walk is a life of obedience to Him. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. He tells us in Christ, He is the eternal salvation. He is the source of eternal salvation. So abundant living for a Christian is a life of growth. We're to grow. We're to grow from time to time. We're to, we're to grow from the time we're born again to a new life in Christ. That's what we're to do as a Christian. We have to grow to maturity in Christ, and we keep doing that. We keep growing. We keep studying. We keep learning His will for our life. We keep growing according to His will. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, he says, Like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. That's why we are growing Christians. Abundant living as a Christian is a life of prayer. We are to be praying. We're to be praying Christians. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 17 tells us, pray without ceasing. In other words, a, a prayer is to be on our heart and our life constantly. We depend on God and believe, in, and more than that, He wants to hear from us. So prayer is our direct communication at the throne of God. It's our direct communication with God. It's one of the greatest benefits that we have as a Christian, and we know that God hears and answers our prayers. We are to be workers for the Lord to have an abundant life. Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20 in the Great Commission. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I command you, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. So we serve a risen Savior. Jesus Christ is in our life as a Christian. And as a Christian, we are to bear fruit. We're to be a fruit-bearing Christian. We want everyone to have an abundant life. When I think of fruit bearing, I think of, of where I used to go to high school in AD 30. There was, there was a pear tree and two a day practices were going on. You, and you guys know my age, you know we didn't get any ice, we didn't get any water, we didn't get nothing. Just go out there and work and die. And we, we made it. And, and every time after practice, the line was so long for the water fountain that I would walk over to this lady. She had a pear tree in her yard. And I'd grab me a pear and eat that pear. It's so juicy and sweet, sweet and it tasted so good. And the second day, that lady had a chair for me underneath that tree. So I'd go over and I'd get a pear and I'd sit in that tree and I'd eat some of her pears. And we're to be fruit-bearing Christians. She was bearing fruit for me, wasn't she? And we're to be fruit-bearing Christians. Jesus told us to be an example in this life. There's only two kinds of people in the world. There's the saved and there's the unsaved. And God wants all to be saved. We're to be the light in the world. We're to be the salt of the earth. And we grow in Christian graces. I want you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, and I want us to look at some words here. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 5. Now for this very reason, 
also applying all diligence to your faith. In your faith, supply moral excellence, and to your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, in your self-control, perseverance, in your perseverance, godliness, in your godliness, brotherly kindness, in your brotherly kindness, love, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling, choosing you. For as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Now let's go back to first there. I want you, I want you, to, I want you to see some words. Diligence. We're to apply diligence in our, in our Christian life. We're to be diligent. Be diligent. Want to. In your, in, and then the next word, moral excellence. We're to be an example for everybody in our community and our families and everybody that we're around. We're to have show moral excellence. Ego on self-control. Or, well, let's get, I missed one, knowledge. We're to have knowledge. We're to study God's Word. It's, it's to be a habit. It's to be, I mean, this is God's Word for, to us, to us, from God. So we're to be students of the God's Word. We're to make an application to our life each day. So knowledge, let's go on. Self-control. We're to control ourselves. Too many in this world, boy, they go without self, they go with no control. And that makes us different because we're trying to exercise self-control in our life. And look at the next one, perseverance. You know, everything in this life don't, don't go exactly the way we want it to, does it? Does it? But, but we persevere. We hold on. We have faith. We move on. And then the next one, godliness. We're to be godly in our life as a Christian. Next one, brotherly kindness. Well, I know congregations, you just, they don't have that. They don't have brotherly love and kindness for one another. Next one, love. Love. And then he says, if, if these qualities are yours, and they're doing what? Increasing. Then they render you neither useless or unfruitful in the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But look at who lacks them. He who lacks these qualities is blind. They're short-sighted. They have forgotten his purification. They have forgotten the price that Jesus paid on the cross for us. They're all about stuff and things in this world instead of serving a risen Savior. And then you go on. As long as you practice these things, which we must practice as a Christian. You'll never stumble. Never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what we want. That's why we are to live an abundant life and be abundant. Living an abundant life in Jesus Christ on this earth is a... Now, listen to this. <laughs> you watch me. Living an abundant life in Christ on this earth is to live free of condemnation. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I, I didn't say it. Paul said it. Those who obey the Lord's gospel, not some other fellow's gospel, and having been baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins, and then we are to walk in the light, as He is in the light, and living our lives faithful to Him, then we are under no condemnation. But without obedience to Jesus Christ, guess what? We are under condemnation because we won't obey Him in our life. Their condition of such a, such a condition is, is a condition of no hope. After this life. Romans 8, 2, the very next verse. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. 
Oh, man. It pays, doesn't it? It's worth every price you have to pay to be a faithful Christian, to have that abundant life. By being in Christ, we have been made free. Romans 6, verse 3 through 6. Or do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ, have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death so that Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father so we too might walk in newness of life. Newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died in the watery grave is freed from sin. It's vital. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, it's vital. Everyone in here has. But if you hadn't, you have to be in him. And the only way you can be in him is Galatians 3, verse 26 through 27. For you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you have been baptized into Christ, have put on or clothed yourselves in Christ. You put on Christ in baptism to be in Him. As Christians then, searching for the abundant life that we all want as a Christian, we have to walk in the light. We have to walk in the light. First John, 5, 1 John 1, verse 5. 1 John 1 and verse 5 tells us exactly how and exactly why. 1 John 1, verse 5 through 9, this is a message we have heard from Him and announced to you that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, yet walk in the darkness, what happens? We're a liar. We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can only do this by the blood of Christ. We contact His blood in the waters of baptism when we're given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2 and verse 38. Romans 8, verse 9 and 10. However, he says, Paul says, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. It's the only hope that we have in this world that we live in, that we'll be obedient to the Lord so that we can walk in the light and we obey His will in our life and we are recipients of God's amazing grace. Look at Galatians chapter 5 with me, beginning at verse 16. Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh for these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident which are immor imm immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, and drunkenness, carousing, things like these which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have, been, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let's, let us also walk by the Spirit. You see, that's why we're fruit-bearing Christians. We walk by the Spirit. We have to grow and develop as a Christian in order to live and have a more abundant life. Hebrews 3, verse 12 through 14, he, the Hebrew writer says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it's called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. So a Christian, someone who wants to be a Christian, the truth has to be searched for and has to be learned. The truth of God's Word must be believed with all the heart and soul and mind. Then the truth has to be obeyed. Peter and the apostles told believers on the day of Pentecost exactly what to do. There were no shortcuts in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Once we become a Christian, we want the abundant life, and so we are under obligation to love the Lord and love our neighbors. Matthew 22, verse 37 through 39, Jesus says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind. This is the, uh, this is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's not easy, is it? We are to love our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a challenge for us. First John 4 and verse 20, we're to love our neighbors and our friends. And the biggest challenge of all, love your enemies. Romans 12, 20 and 21. But see, we're growing every day as a Christian. We're learning how to do these things. Having abundant life is obedient to God. Our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the author of eternal salvation. Hebrews 5, verse 8 and 9. Those who love the Lord faithfully, we follow Him. Those who reject Him, those that refuse to obey the Lord, will be condemned at the judgment. So let's review those facts again. If you are a Christian, are you walking in the light? Are you living faithful in your life each day? Are you the proper example to others in your community or anybody you come across? If not, you need to turn back, come back to him and repent before it's too late to be the proper example. We all want that abundant life. If we can help in any way this evening, won't you come while we stand and sing?